We are delighted to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. David Brown, Professor of Scottish History, University of Glasgow, who is here to give a talk titled The Medieval Afterlife of the Declaration of Our Broth. After its dispatch to the Pope in 1320, it is thought that the Declaration of Our Broth was largely forgotten. More than 20 copies survive from the subsequent two centuries and are found in Latin histories of the Scots. This talk will explain how this document formed part of the standard Latin account of Scottish history and how it was read and altered by scribes over time. It also considers the Declaration of Our Broth as part of the general history of the Scots rather than a standalone document. Over to you, David. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Tessa, and a warm welcome to you all from all corners of the globe. And it's a great pleasure to give this lecture. So the famous letter to Pope John XXII, written by Robert I's government in the name of Scottish barons and the community of the realm, known in modern times as the Declaration of Our Broth, survives today as an original file copy, albeit a bit damaged. And it's this that is being exhibited this month in the National Museums of Scotland. The copy sent to the Pope, of course, has never been found. The file copy is a remarkable survival. Most of the Scottish royal archives were lost at sea on their way from London to Edinburgh after Scotland's independence was restored in 1660. Thankfully, the file copy had been removed in 1612, long before Cromwell took the Scottish archives to England and so it escaped the eventual fate of so many other royal documents. The file copy of the Declaration of Our Broth had been taken home for safekeeping by Thomas Hamilton when he was Lord Clark Register while work was being done on Edinburgh Castle, which is where the archives were at the time. When he became Earl of Haddington in 1628 and purchased Tinningham House as the family's principal residence, he kept the Declaration there. And it stayed there until the ninth Earl returned it in, 19, in 1829 to the Deputy Lord Clerk Register, predecessor of the Keeper of Records, in whose care it has remained ever since. Before its removal in 1612, there was no indication that much attention had been paid to the file copy since it was produced in 1320 and deposited in Edinburgh Castle. And this is not surprising. File copies are, after all, meant to rest quietly and safely in the depths of an archive, rather than being regularly read, copied or displayed. And this was, of course, long before archives were open to the public and organised for ease of reference. It is striking, therefore, that the Lord Clerk Register in 1612, Thomas Hamilton, noticed it at all and took it home. Once it had been released from its ancient slumber, however, it naturally became an item of pride and curiosity for Hamilton's descendants, something special, for example, to show their guests at Tunningham. Eventually, later in the 17th century, the declaration began to be copied, printed, and eventually translated as a standalone document in its own right. It is easy to see why the declaration is said to have been forgotten for centuries and only became famous after the file copy had been rediscovered and published in the late 17th century. But that is only true if we think of the declaration as the file copy alone. The declaration also existed in another form that was more accessible than a dusty archive. This is because it was included in late medieval history books in Latin recounting the kingdom's past and the origins of the Scots in the 14th century or later. And here is part of the declaration in a manuscript of Scottish Chronicon, one of the main versions of the kingdom's history in Latin composed in the 1440s. The text of this Latin history of the kingdom was revised, expanded and rewritten a number of times in the 14th and 15th centuries. And each colour here represents a different version, including the Declaration of Our Broth. One version stops at David I's death in 1153. Every other version includes a copy of the Declaration of Our Broth. And here are the manuscripts of the various interrelated versions of the kingdom's history in Latin. <laughs> 
and I only went as far as around 1520. There are a few later. Fortunately, very few of the manuscripts are in anything like pristine condition. And I say fortunately, because the more there are scribbles in the margin and underlining of passages, the more we can see what some owners and readers found interesting. And I'll return to this towards the end. It's interesting to see that some of these editions are in early modern rather than late medieval handwriting. And this shows that these manuscripts were still being used by at least a few people in the early 17th century, even though there was by then a number of new, very different versions of the kingdom's history in print by John Mayer, Hector Boyce, and George Buchanan. And this might help to explain why Thomas Hamilton decided to take the file copy of the Declaration home in 1612 for safekeeping while building works were taking place in Edinburgh Castle. Given his interest in Scotland's past, it would not be too surprising if he was familiar with one of the late medieval versions of the kingdom's history in Latin and had read the declaration there and was therefore able to recognize it and see its importance. Now, this can only be a guess. What is not in dispute, of course, is that he thought that the file copy of the declaration was so important and interesting that he took it home for safekeeping. In this talk, I will mention two other people, both anonymous, I'm afraid, who also did something very striking with the declaration because they thought it was so important. The first of these was in around 1330, and the other in about 1460. And I've given them a red outline here, or at least the works a red outline. I'll then say something about how the scribes of the late medieval Latin history of the kingdom treated the text of the declaration, and I'll finish with some reactions to the declaration by owners or readers of the manuscripts when they underlined passages or added marginal comments. So the first of these interventions, datable to probably around 1330, is the most complex to reveal. We begin with a version of the kingdom's history produced by John Forden in the mid 1380s. The box of the main manuscripts is given a red outline on the slide. This became the core of all subsequent versions of the kingdom's history in Latin until John Mayer and Hector Boyce wrote a very different kind of history in the 1520s. John Forden's work only runs chronolo chronologically as far as David I's death in 1153, however. This is in five books. He left a sixth book on David I's English royal ancestors incomplete. And I should say in the Middle Ages, a book was not necessarily a separate volume. It was often a way of dividing a, a large work into more manageable parts. The most obvious problem with Forden's incomplete text, therefore, was that the kingdom's history fell short by a couple of centuries. Histories do not normally run all the way up to the present day, of course. They might, however, be expected to reach as far as a significant event in the recent past. Now, David I's death in 1153 was certainly too remote, more than 230 years before Forden's own day, and this gap obviously continued to grow as time passed. A quick solution was to find another historical work which covered at least some of the missing centuries and add that to Forden's history. And this is, in fact, what someone did sometime in the late 14th or early 15th centuries, and I've given that stage a red outline. And here is what was added to Forden's history. If you read the resulting text as a continuous narrative, though, there are some very odd features. The most obvious are the book divisions in bold, and I'll come to these in a minute probably seem very confusing. You've got Forden's history in book one to five, and then you go on a bit more and you're told book five ends and book six begins and so on. I'd like to begin, however, with the first 47 chapters that were added to Forden's work. What is very odd is that these actually repeat the content of part of Forden's book five and all his incomplete book six. Not only do they tell the same story, as it were, but the texts are very similar. On closer inspection, it is apparent that this overlapping material is in fact an earlier version of Forden's text, which Forden himself has rewritten slightly, so his principal source. 
A simple explanation for this would be if someone has taken an old manuscript of a pre fordon version of the kingdom's history, broken it up into separate gatherings, if it was bound at all, and then physically added the last few gatherings to a manuscript of John of Fordon's history. So you can see here how a manuscript consists of a number of gatherings, which can be pulled out quite readily. So it is a bit like taking an old book and ripping out the last part and sticking this onto the end of another book, which seems terrible, but wouldn't be quite so unusual to do in the Middle Ages or early modern period. This might have been quite straightforward indeed to do if we bear in mind that manuscripts were not necessarily bound like a modern book. Be this as it may, it would certainly have been the quickest way to extend John of Forden's history beyond David I's death in 1153. You simply rip out a chunk of a previous book and stick it on at the end. It would not be surprising if there was a significant overlap as a result, especially if whole gatherings were being transferred from an old manuscript to the end of a manuscript of Borden's history. So what was this older work in the old manuscript that I am proposing was cannibalized in this terrible way? The material added to some manuscripts of Forden's work is all that survives of this pre forden history of the kingdom. The original manuscript with the proposed cannibalized gatherings added to it, of course, has long disappeared. When we look in the surviving copies of it, however, we can see that it consisted of seven books. Only two book divisions survive, that is statements that one book ends and usually until the end that the next one begins. So book five ends, book six begins. And you'll see that the book division for the end of book six and the beginning of book seven has gone. The copies haven't included that. Interestingly, in the case of book seven, we're only told that it ends. So it looks like this older work originally ended there too, even though there is a rag bag of other texts that follow it. And these look like they've been added at some point to blank pages at the end of a manuscript. So here, to cut a long story short, is for the last part of this pre fordon history of the kingdom almost certainly contained. There are clear indications that this older work was Fordon's principal source, Fordon writing in the 1380s, and that it originally encompassed the kingdom's history from Scottish origins. It may also have continued its narrative as far as 1304, although what survives stops abruptly in 1285 before continuing with the declaration of our growth as we'll see in a minute. All that survives therefore is the last couple of books added rather crudely to Forden's incomplete work. And towards the end, we find the declaration of our growth. So let's look at this a bit more closely. So we'll now look at the red bit in more detail. And this is what is lurking under the red bits in the previous slide. So this older cannibalized work finished with a series of documents that, with one exception, was originally a dossier prepared by the Scottish procurators at the Papal Court in 1301. And I'll refer to this in short as Bizet's dossier, because Baldred Bizet was the lead Scottish procurator, i.e. legal eagle, at the Papal Court. The one exception is the first document in the series, the Declaration of Our Broth, right at the top of the slide. The decision by whoever wrote this older history of the kingdom to include the declaration was a momentous one because, as a result, it was copied and recopied as part of Scotland's history thereafter. If the author of this older work had not included the declaration, then it is likely, as far as we can tell, that the declaration would indeed have been much less well known in the Middle Ages. But that isn't all. We should also give credit to the person who decided to continue Forden's incomplete work very crudely by removing the last few gatherings of a manuscript of this older work and sticking it onto their manuscript of Forden's incomplete work. It is only because of this that any part of this pre forden work survives at all, including its copy of the Declaration of Abroth. And you can see that the lines of textual submission all flow from this.
Again, but for this, it is likely that the declaration would have been largely forgotten. Not completely, however. Only one other copy is known, and it is in the letter book of a prior of St Andrews, but its source is unknown, and it's quite difficult to make sense of. So why did the anonymous author of this older pre forden work copy the declaration into their history of the kingdom? The answer is a bit unexpected. The author has added some linking passages when copying this group of documents on Scottish independence, i.e. the declaration followed by the documents in Bizet's dossier. And the linking bits I've just put in bold there, I haven't given you the whole thing. So the first of these passages links the declaration not to 1320 when it was written, but to Edward I's conquest in 1304. And this helps to explain a bit of a puzzle, which is the title given to the declaration in all subsequent versions of the kingdom's history in the late Middle Ages. It reads, the descendants of the Scots of noble prowess protest in this manner to the Lord Pope John XXII concerning the wrongs inflicted on them by Edward, King of England. There is in fact only a single sentence in the declaration where Edward I's atrocities are the primary focus. There we are told of his, I quote, acts of violence, pillagings, burnings, imprisonments of prelates, burnings of monasteries, robbings and killings of regular clergy, and other outrageous and countless deeds, sparing none on account of age or sex, religion or rank. So that's quite vivid, but why should this be highlighted? There's plenty other vivid prose in the Declaration. The Declaration's account of Edward's atrocities was presented here in this uh, pre forden work of Scottish history as referring to 1304. The fact the Declaration is a letter to the Pope linked it to Bizet's dossier which finishes with the text of Bizet's pleading, i.e. Bizet's presentation of the case for Scottish independence that he prepared for the papal court. The paramount concern of whoever put the declaration and Bizet's dossier together at the end of their history of the Scottish kingdom, therefore, was to place the memory of Edward I's conquest and occupation in 1304 center stage, using the declaration of Arbroath and to provide readers with a full account of how Scotland's independence had been justified by Scottish procurators at the Curia led by Boulder Bizet in 1301. Perhaps the declaration and the dossier were seen as complementing each other. Bizet had also referred to Edward I's atrocities. Indeed, that's how his pleading begins. The declaration's account is more vivid, however. The declaration, for its part, provided a powerful justification of Scottish independence but it lacks the full range of arguments and counter-arguments in Bizet's dossier or the legal sophistication of Bizet's pleading. In short, the declaration is political, written in the voice of barons, and is full of martial vigor, whereas Bizet's pleading is jurisprudential and the dossier judicially comprehensive. It is very difficult to say when this history of the kingdom, the first to include the declaration, was written. There is a fairly strong hint that it was sometime after the Robert I was granted an annual subsidy by Parliament in 1326, renewed in 1328 for the rest of his life, in order to meet his living expenses. I've given you a wee quote there from it. Now, this arrangement was unprecedented. So it's striking that in Forden's history, we find something very similar being granted to Melcolum II, who was king from 1005 to 1034. But at this, of course, here it is. This, of course, is entirely fictional. We need to remember that Forden based his history on the earlier pre forden work written by the person who had included the declaration for the first time. So if I would give you a bit more time, you'd be able to see how the two match each other quite well. 
It's also significant that although the king's living expenses became an issue again in 1367, no mention was made of the subsidy granted to Robert, and a different solution was found, as if the whole thing had been forgotten. We are left then with a circumstantial hint that this older pre forden history incorporating the declaration of our broth may have been written around 1330. And this all hinges on this very precise um, resonance with the indenture between Robert I and the community of the realm concerning his living expenses and the passage there about Malcolm II getting a similar arrangement. The decision to end the narrative of the kingdom's history at its darkest hour, when Edward I completed his second conquest in 1304, and to use the declaration as the only statement that independence was restored by Robert I, is therefore a very dramatic choice. Was this a powerful narrative gesture, written when Robert I's health began to fail in 1327, for example, by presenting the issue of independence as something fought for by barons, and freeholders and argued judicially in the papal court? Or was it a few years later, when the Bruce cause and any hopes of independence seemed again to have been crushed in the mid-1330s, with Edward Balliol installed by Edward III as a vassal king? I'm afraid there's no way of telling. All we can be sure of is that the declaration was the key ingredient here. The author of this pre forden history of the kingdom obviously knew of the declaration and regarded it and Baldwin Bizet's dossier as statements of the kingdom's independence of fundamental importance. By including the declaration in our history in this way, the author bequeathed it to future generations of readers of Scotland's history. It was quite hard going, I'm sure. It's gonna get easier from now on, I can assure you. Now, Walter Bauer, when he extended Forden's history to the death of James I in, 13, in 1437 in his Scottish Chronicon, here we are, um, written in the 1440s, included the declaration in his account of events in 1320s. We put it where you might think it should belong. And this was repeated in Bower's revised 40 book version of Scottish Chronicon. Bower's text was itself rewritten by the author of an 11 book work based on Scottish Chronicon, which was heavily revised. And this is known to scholars as the Book of Pluscan, completed in 1461. Although the author's identity cannot be established, he spent some of his career in France, and it seems that he was a Gallic speaker. This thus, for instance, uh, this for instance would explain why, when Bauer in Scottish Chronicon refers to Clan Catton, Pluscadon gives the Gallic name Clown Gillehatton. In the Declaration of Arbroath, he changes the surname of Alexander Fraser, one of the barons listed at the beginning, to Frisil, the Gallic form. Whoever the author of Pluscadon was, he apparently regarded the Declaration of Arbroath as the most important document in Scottish history. Now, he does not say so explicitly, it is more a matter of action, speaking louder than words. He incorporated some documents in his work. In the case of the Declaration, however, he included it twice, as you can see here on the screen, first in book, book eight and also in book nine. Each is a separate box on the slide with a thick black outline. In the first occasion, it appears along with Bizet's dossier. It has been moved, however, so it comes before Bizet's pleading, the last document in the dossier, rather than before the dossier as a whole. In the second occasion, in Book 9, he included it in the events of 1320, just as Bauer did in the Scottish Chronicle. The author of Pluscadon was not interested in simply reproducing the documents he quoted as sober records, however. He wanted to bring them to life by heightening their prose so that their message was more vivid for the reader. He did this to the declaration of our broth, even though you might think that his prose was compelling enough already. What is remarkable is that he rewrote the declaration in different ways on each occasion he included it, in book eight and again in book nine of his work. There can be no doubt, therefore, that he made a deliberate choice to include the declaration twice 
It is as if he wanted to emphasize different aspects of the text when he rewrote it and needed to give the declaration twice in order to have an opportunity to do so. So here is an example of his rewriting of the text, finishing with a famous deposition clause. The bold font shows where the author of Ploskadon has created new prose, and the crossed out passages show what was omitted from the declaration as he would have found it in Bower's Scottish Chronicon. And you can see that he has made lots of changes in this passage, and it's impossible to read. So let's try it a bit differently. It's easier to read if I give it like this, with bold showing Ploskadon's new prose. And if you have the leisure to do so, you could then cast your eye onto the bit above, which is the immediate source, the same passage in the copy of the Declaration in Scottish Chronicle. The changes Ploskadon's author made are more a matter of heightening the original prose than making fundamental changes. Even so, this makes the Declaration even more striking than it already was. For example, by saying uh, that Bruce was elected king, as well as being king by inheritance of divine sanction, a bit of underlined there, and that if he submits in any way to the English, the barons in unison will expel him as their chief enemy. There was one piece of detail where Pluskadon made a substantial change to the, to the declaration's content, both in the copy included in book eight and in book nine. On both occasions, Pluskadon added that the Scots originally inhabited Ireland. Now, this was not an unusual thing to say, but it was not stated in the declaration itself. I wonder if the author of Pluskadon was particularly keen on this because of being a Gaelic speaker, identifying with Gaelic speakers generally from Munster to Caithness. Finally, I should mention that in Book 9, the second time the declaration appears in the Book of Pluskadon, the text stops two thirds of the way through because we are told a lack of time. Cross references given to, uh, to the copy in book eight. The author of Pluskadon had done all the rewriting that he wanted to do. To our eyes, the way the author of Pluskadon rewrote the declaration seems brazen and outrageous. We expect documents to be copied faithfully. It is certainly very unusual to find a scribe who changes the text they were copying quite so much as did the author of Pluskadon. It is, on the other hand, quite rare to find a scribe who made no changes at all. When any alterations are made, however slight, we tend to berate scribes for not doing their job properly. It is difficult to tell, of course, if changes were made deliberately or were simply mistakes. There might also have been a scribe's immediate response to the text as they copied it, rather than a definite change that was planned in advance. And here is a fairly tiny example in Bower's own copy of his Scottish Chronicle, which survives today in Corpus Christi College, Cambridge. In the translation, the change is from Lordship of the English to Dominion of the English, and that may seem hardly any change at all. But there is minimally a difference of emphasis. Lordship, Dominium seems more tangible, involving a personal relationship between lord and vassal, rather than dominion, dominio, which is more abstract. Now, here are a couple more examples of scribal changes in famous passages, and these can be found in a, in a resource for schools in Education Scotland's National Improvement Hub. The first shows how the text was altered slightly in different ways in three manuscripts referred to here as onward. H and FC. So you can see it's color coded. So you can see that manuscript R has changed to give up what he has begun to give up those things he has begun. H has changed wish to put us our kingdom under the control of the English or their king to and wish to hand us or our kingdom over to the English. You can see this sort of thing. So they're small changes, but they are changes nonetheless. The other example shows some other changes in manuscripts R and H. And these are both manuscripts of Bower's Scottish Chronicle. So it's not uncommon for scribes to feel they have a bit of freedom just to tweak what they're doing. Now a rough tally of these changes to the declaration's text shows how frequently this occurred. And again, don't try and absorb all the detail, but you can see there's a fair bit of this going on. 
And all this can be studied in more detail in what is referred to as a dynamic edition of the declaration in the website of the Community of the Realm Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project. And this is based on an exhaustive examination of all manuscript copies up to around 1520. Unfortunately, this work was cut short by the pandemic, which prevented a final physical examination of two of the manuscripts. Finally, let us turn to owners and readers of these manuscripts. The scribes of manuscripts R and H, and this is a picture of H, were copying the declaration as part of Scottish Chronicon, which they were reproducing in its entirety, of course. The owners of these manuscripts, and also potentially other readers, were similarly engaged with the kingdom's history as a whole, not just the Declaration of Arbroath. When they were particularly interested in a passage, they would mark it by underlining or point it out in some other way. These readers or owners' marks have been studied by Murray Todd as part of his PhD thesis at the University of Glasgow, completed in 2005. He found that parts of the declaration had been underlined or pointed out in six manuscripts. For example, the rousing statement about resisting the English for as long as a hundred of us remain alive, it's here, or where it was claimed that Robert Bruce was the latest in an unbroken sequence of 113 Kings of Scots without the intrusion of a single foreigner. Murray Todd drew attention to the lack of any detectable reader interest in one of the most famous passages today, the so-called Deposition Clause, where it is stated that Robert Bruce would be treated as an enemy and replaced as king if he ever submitted to the King of England. Although this has captured the modern imagination as a statement of popular sovereignty, it can be read as making only a very specific point without necessarily implying a general constitutional principle. It is not until the 17th century that there is any positive indication that this sentence was thought to be especially notable. This is in a transcript of the declaration made, it seems, for Luke Wadding, a notable Irish Franciscan historian, by his nephew in the mid 17th century. And this reminds us powerfully that the text is important, not only for what it meant at the time it was written, but how it was read in later centuries. It could be argued, therefore, that the deposition clause only began to be seen as referring to a constitutional principle in the 17th century. I should stress that this does not negate the declaration as a constitutional document. It simply would mean that it might not have become this until it was seen as such long after it was originally composed. It is very difficult, of course, to date when a passage in a manuscript was underlined. We are on more solid ground when dealing with comments in the margin. Handwriting can be dated and can also be associated with a particular country or region. Now I'd like to return to the manuscript where it was highlighted that Robert Bruce was the latest in an unbroken sequence of 113 Kings of Scots. This is in a manuscript book that belonged to the Duke of Burgundy's library. It is in fact a copy of the Book of Pluscredon. This particular passage in the declaration was not only underlined, but commented on in the margin. To my eyes, this is not in a typically Scottish kind of handwriting. If my suspicion is correct, then it is possible that we are looking here at something that was written in the margin by a member of the Duke of Burgundy's household. It would certainly have been understandable for anyone associated immediately with the Duke of Burgundy to have a lively interest in the antiquity of the Scottish kingdom. Being royal, gave the King of Scots and his family something which no money could buy. The Duke of Burgundy was immensely wealthy, but would always be lower than the King of Scots in the European pecking order. He could try and make his ceremonial headgear as fancy as he liked, but he could not alter the fact that it was not a crown. It's just a hunt, really. By contrast, Scotland was regarded as one of the most ancient kingdoms in Europe. So, to finish. It might be assumed that a document as well known and intensely studied as the Declaration of Arbroath would have yielded all its secrets by now. What we know, however, is always limited by what we think it is important to find out about. Until recently, the only copy of any interest was the famous file copy that is on exhibition this month. 
it is certainly worth all the attention it receives. Thanks, thanks to the uh, National Records of Scotland's own Alan Borthwick and the team of conservators, we now understand it even better than before. Until recently, however, it was regarded as the only copy that really counted for anything. And this was because scholars assumed that in order to understand a text, we should focus on its original, or at least its earliest form. Now, this is indeed a key concern. It's never going to be unimportant. Until recently, however, this meant that later copies were often ignored, unless it could be argued that they preserved an even earlier version of a text. And this was certainly the case of the Declaration of Arbroath. The advent of the 700th anniversary provided an excellent reason to examine all the late medieval copies for the first time. As a result, we can see that the declaration was regarded as of prime importance as early as around 1330 and again 1460. We can also see that its significance has changed over time. Initially, its account of Edward I's atrocities caught the eye. It is only much later in the mid 17th century that someone highlighted the deposition clause. It is tempting to see this as a lineal progression, moving from one interpretation to or one interpretation to another over the centuries. In each case, however, all we can actually see is choices made by individuals. These can be spectacular, such as the author of the book of Pluscadon, including it twice in his work and rewriting it in different ways each time or they can be as minor as a scribal tweak of the text or a reader's underlining of a passage. When we think of the Declaration, it is wonderful to remember how it has been and will always be significant to people in different ways. And you can be part of this too, simply by reading and rereading it and see what you think and feel as you do so. Thank you very much.